If you've been following the war in Ukraine over the last year, you've probably heard some snippets of Russia's narrative, that we're locked in an existential conflict with a country run by Nazis. But wait, isn't President Zelensky Jewish? And wasn't this supposed to be about NATO? How does one arrive at that worldview, and what is this war actually about for Russia? Welcome to another episode of the Bear Market Brief. I'm your host, Aaron. Today we're going to focus on cultural and historical memory in Russia, narratives about the war, and how support, or at least assent for the war, is generated. Joining to help explain is Jade McGlynn. Jade McGlynn is a research fellow at the Department of War Studies, King's College London. She's the author of a very new book called Russia's War, I'm including a link in the description, as well as the forthcoming Memory Makers. Her research focuses on Russia's war on Ukraine since 2014, as well as Russian state-society relations, propaganda, and memory politics. Prior to joining King's College, Jade held academic research positions and lectureships at Middlebury College and the University of Oxford. Before we begin, just a quick note that you're going to hear some of the propagandized narrative in this episode, and I hope it's clear that we are not endorsing that viewpoint, just discussing it. And with that said, let's get started. Jade, welcome to the Bear Market Brief. Thanks for coming by today. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start uh, before we jump into today's very interesting subject matter. Uh, tell me a little bit about your research focuses these days and a book you just wrote, uh, Russia's War. So my research focus for for Russia's War and also for another book that's out in, in June, uh, Memory Makers, in a way they're quite similar um, because since 2014, I've been very interested in just trying to understand sort of what is happening in terms of post-Soviet identity construction, so the different ways that, that people make sense of, of what it means to be Russian and what keeps Russia together, what unites Russia. But also, I suppose, the, the dynamics between that and and particularly foreign policy. Um, and and um, although Russia's War, the, the book that's out on Friday, uh, was written very quickly, in some ways, actually, I mean, it was... It was being written since 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 Feb- February twenty second, twenty fourteen, when Yanukovych fled. Um, and um, I mean, I suppose um, in terms of in terms of, of what the book looks at, it has it's about different perspectives on and, and attitudes towards the war in Russia. So the title has has two meanings. It looks at, at why people back or approve the war and, and why maybe support isn't the right term. Um, but it also looks at, at the narratives and the frames used to present the war and, and its many facets to, to Russians. And that includes the content that that different audiences have chosen to engage with. Um, so that's your infamous sort of television propaganda that we now see, um, unfortunately, on our on our Twitter feeds. But you know, also the the most popular uncensored Telegram channels. And I've been looking at how that shifted since the war began in 2014, but also since this second full scale war began in in 2022. And then, you know, alongside that, there's, you know, some sort of intellectual history and, and interviews to, to help to, to not make it so kind of data heavy. Well, excited to cover at least some of that grounds today. So very keen to hear more. Um, let's jump straight in. Not too long ago, speaking of TV news clips on Twitter, I saw one mm-hmm. that left me a little bit perplexed, you might say. Um, mm-hmm. In it, a uh, host expressed outrage that ru- that rather Israel's foreign minister was visiting a Nazi state, including Ukraine's Jewish president, who also happens to be a Nazi. Now, I happen to be Jewish and a descendant of Holocaust survivors, and I thought I had a pretty good beat on who's a Nazi and who isn't. So am I misunderstanding something here? How do you reconcile that worldview? Where does that come from? Mm-hmm. I don't think the problem is you. I'll put it that way. You aren't misunderstanding what a Nazi is. Um, the word Nazi, I think, to, in Russia today, it just has a completely different meaning. So we, as you've referenced there, we all know about the Kremlin's claims of denazification, that they're fighting Nazis in Kiev. And, and we know how absurd they sound, to at least to, to Western ears, when you used to talk about a country with a democratically elected Jewish president. But if you immerse yourself in the Russian narrative, it actually does make sense um so in the russian in the sort of and when i say russian here i'm just talking about the mainstream view that has you know some popular buy-in and that is 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 promoted by by officials 
So in this view, the Russian soldiers spilt blood for, for European land. Um, they liberated Europe fighting fascism, you know, under the guise of the Soviet Union, which is often nationalized now to, to just Russia. And therefore, they have a right to at least some of that land and at least to a buffer zone. Um, and what you see here is in this way that the anti-fascism of the war of, of the Second World War of the Great Patriotic War, it then begins to merge into one with a more generalised and imperialist sense of ownership over and right to other people's countries, other countries' territories, sorry, that is, that's clearly a central feature of Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. And it's a sort of a retelling of, of, of the Great Patriotic War, where it's really focused on, it's completely de-ideologized, like much of Russia's memory, of, of Russian cultural memory about the Soviet Union. So you don't have any of the kind of communist or anti-fascist element. What you have is, okay, we fought Nazis, and that meant getting all of, you know, <laughs> controlling all of this territory. And so in a weird way, because the anti-fascism element's been drained empty, you just have the imperialistic land grabs and occupations that, that, that happened after 1945. And so 1945 sort of bestows upon Russia this, this moral right to do this. And that's why anybody who disagrees with Russia's interpretation of the war is essentially just branded a Nazi and is seen as a Nazi because they are disagreeing with Russia's right to control countries that it's had, that, that you know, that it at least in part earned through defeating Nazism in 1945. So there's a, there is a weird kind of logic, but... I appreciate it's 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 not that obvious. So I guess this this relates to as a bigger picture here the the role of World War II in you know, Russian mm-hmm. cultural memory and uh, how the state and how Russians see themselves. Certainly, something I bumped into uh, studying abroad in Russia back in the day. Um, my program leaders gave very, very strong advice as a general matter never to bring up World War II in conversation. Uh, They'd say that it would arouse a lot of strong feelings. And certainly when it did come up in conversation, it did. So I guess the broader question is, is what does World War II mean in Russia today? Has that meaning changed over the years? Um, It seems very present for a war that happened. Now, I'm aware of the casualty count in in the Soviet Union and 20, 30 million, but it was, what, 75 years ago? So Explain the, the place in society it's, it seemingly still has. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, that's it's very true. And yes, um, nobody warned me of that. And I, I wish they had. I remember being a, like a Borussia, I think it was Borussia Dortmund or no Bayern Munich and Chelsea match. And everybody was doing like Hitler's kaput <laughs> um, signs in the bar um, when, when Bayern Munich lost. And I was like, what is going on? And I, clearly, I mean, perhaps you can't tell from looking at me, but I don't, I don't generally hang out in like bad bars or kind of football, football, um, the fog bars, but to come to a more kind of in, intellectual um, glance on things. Um, one of the very few things that unites Russia, that unites post-Soviet Russia um is, as a nation that, that means that Russians belong together really is the memory and the pride um, in the Great Patriotic War. You know, there's a lot of trauma from the Soviet past and obviously from the Soviet collapse as as, as well. And um, the Great Patriotic War gives people something to, to feel proud of after a period when, um, you know, people didn't feel very proud to be, be Russian. Um, and the first thing to note, of course, is probably for your listeners, is that I'm referring to the Great Patriotic War, not World War II. So unlike World War II, the Great Patriotic War starts in 1941, conveniently um, avoiding the, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Um, and there's little space in the official narrative, but also in the popular narrative, um, for any discussion of the disastrous retreats, for example, in summer 1941. But of course, there's lots for the heroic defense of Moscow and, and, and Stalingrad as this epic turning point. And then naturally what Russians call the, the liberation of, of Eastern Europe um, from, from 1944 through 1945. There's very little mention of the West. And I have to say the same is obviously completely true of the UK and the US um, narratives. Um, so, you know, this is not to pick on Russia. Only thing that's really discussed, um, and Putin makes a, long, um, a lot of references to this in his, his uh, 2020 essay on the, the, the or- causes and origins, I think, of, of World War II. Um, so the references to the West suggest that they tried to bleed Russia dry by delaying the opening of a second front and also to suggest that the US and the UK were actually you know, on the verge of making a secret pact 
with Nazi Germany to attack Russia. And this is this features in very popular kind of Brezhnev era um, spy dramas. Um, but this 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 theory, um, this kind of mythical betrayal, um, and it also features in, in in current kind of popular films. And it it um, it's generally quite believed maybe not as a fact but as a sort of broader truth that you can't trust the west the west are going to just kind of try and screw over um russia like they tried to screw over um the the soviet union and, and eventually did screw over by, by destroying it in this in this kind of official history um so what part of the issue is the the large number of deaths uh, generally sort of said to be around 27 million um but of course they're they're, they're soviet deaths and they're often misremembered as russians even though proportionally the the highest proportion of deaths is in belarus followed by ukraine um and but the idea is that these this amount of sort of russian side and that's what aren't their right to sort of this a buffer zone as we were discussing just in the previous question um and anybody who doesn't agree with this interpretation of history or of Russia's right to the sort of sphere of influence similar to that which the USSR had after 45 is, is deemed, you know, as, as a Nazi because they're trying to kind of wish to amend the results of, of, of 1945. But one of the key things here, and you, you referred to in your question, is fine, we have this narrative, but really what we've seen is that World War II has become part of everyday life. And this is a genuine, this is a policy. It was, um, you know, a concerted action that took place since 2012, um, when Putin, which Putin declared the year of history, and it feels a bit like that year didn't end. Um, and you see this effort, both top down and bottom up, that's important. This was essentially what my PhD looked at. Um, to bring World War II into everyday life, to make it something that's that's part of the everyday, whether that's, you know, during school, fine, but also, you know, after school lessons, summer camps where you recreate battles or you conduct historical disinformation campaigns, murals across the country, um, different clubs and camps, films, television series. And often these are delivered by government affiliated organizations but the government is very good at concealing that it's connected to them and or it sort of takes over more grassroots organizations so people often feel that these are completely bottom-up citizen-led movements they don't see them as political or in any way connected to the government even though often they are or the very least they're funded by the government which then has some kind of you know he who pays the he who pays the pipe decides the tune or whatever it is um but yes um and so you have this constant encouragement really of people to associate themselves with and remember um the memory of the war which is presented you know in all of russia's you know whether or not it's the foreign policy doctrine the national security doc uh yeah the national security doctrine or information security doctrine the idea that this the truth of what happened in world war ii or great patriot report is constantly under threat from outside and I think really that this topic, the extent to which World War II is part of everyday life, but also the extent to which it's been securitized and is seen as something central to Russian identity that is under attack, I think that's been really greatly underestimated in terms of Western policy on Russia, perhaps because everybody feels like the idea of, of times of values and, 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 and ideas are, you know, has passed. But the, the war is showing us, I think this war is showing us that that's not the case. So I guess a follow up question here, and I think this this ties into what's happened in, in Ukraine rather mm-hmm. well. Um, but at the onset of the war, um, Russia's columns that I guess thought they would ride directly into Kiev with no resistance, mm-hmm. these soldiers, um, many of whom did not meet fortunate ends, um, were wearing St. George ribbons. It was on the Russian military vehicles. At the same time, Putin has very frequently talked about um, Russia's kind of imperial legacy from long before World War II, from Peter the Great. These lands were ours before. So is this about a buffer zone? Is this about the Russian Empire? Is this about something else entirely? Is there a clear narrative for what this war is actually over in, in Russia? I think there is at least a clear reasoning um, so if I answer the second part of your question first, and then we'll, we'll come back to the St. George Ribbons, um, which is that Russia, the way that this particular type of post-Soviet Russian identity has been constructed, like the answer to the question of why is Russia a nation and why do Russians belong together, is dependent on the subjugation of Ukraine, not necessarily in the form we're seeing. Political subjugation would have been fine. You know, what sort of the, the situation in, in, in 2012, for example, of Yanukovych, 
Um, but um, and, th and there are different reasons why it has come to this. But broadly, that idea that without Ukraine, um, the understanding of, of Russia, which is broadly as Russia as a great power that has its own special path, that has a mission and that needs a strong state, you know, and, and a different path to that of the West, that doesn't really function without controlling Ukraine. Because why not? Because the entire like myth of Russian history starts from the idea that Russia is the inheritor of Kiev and Rus. So if it's Ukraine, that you know, if it's not, if it's not the inheritor of, of Kiev and Rus, then the idea that it's this great power of a legacy, I mean, this is going back now, this is going back a bit, but obviously, you know, if Ivan the Third, I'm claiming that he has a right to Novgorod, he has a right to increase like Moscow's la uh, Moscow's lands because he is the heir. Um, to Kiev and Rus because of you know Grand Prince uh, Volodymyr of, of Vladimir um, in in, um, in in the Russian uh, rendering, and so although it sounds like okay, but this is just some really niche like historiographical debate, it really isn't. It, it gets to the core of it because if Russia is the heir to Kiev and Rus, of course it is also kind of controls. Um, it should also control Ukraine. It should also be this leader of, of the free Eastern Slavic nations. And what you have with World War II in some ways is almost a mirroring of, of this concept where because it, World War II, Russia, Russia was given, Russia was almost, I suppose, born, if we can talk about a country like that, was born with this, this right or inherited this right. And we also see it with the language around Russia as a third Rome. But it sort of had this right from early on to control other lands, you know, to be, to be special. But with World War II, it really asserted its moral rights as well. So it didn't just have this historical right, you know, this innate essential right, but it also has earned it. So it's it's like a double sort of reinforce. And I imagine the need to reinforce it all the time probably stems from the insecurity that actually there isn't much that that keeps Russia together as a nation and, you know, the, the failure, obviously, to come up with institutions and, and a form of civic identity, um, you know, since the, the fall of the Soviet Union that, that would make for a healthier nation building process. Um, there, there's, there's always time. Um, but yes, yeah, so so that's that's what the, the point of history is. I mean, in general, the history with the exception of Kiev and Rus and, um, and, uh, and World War II, generally the history doesn't matter that much provided it can be used to support these key ideas of Russia needs a strong state, i.e. Putin needs to stay in power or Putin's people need to stay in power. Um, Russia has a special path, i.e. Don't, don't be getting any ideas about democracy or liberalism. We don't have to be like the West. We shouldn't be like the West. And Russia is a great power um, with this mission in the world, i.e. Russia should pursue an incredibly aggressive foreign policy. Yeah, so bo boiling it down, is the essential argument here that the existence of, of Ukraine is a sort of ideological threat to yeah. Russia? It, well, in a weird way, it actually is a sort of existential threat. I mean, I don't think most Russians see it as an existential threat at all, as opposed to Ukrainians, who obviously do, because it literally is an existential threat. It's a threat to Ukraine's existence. Um, and it's been very much uh, described as that um, by you know, uh, Russian leaders and, and, and propagandists. But um, in, in a weird way, it kind of is a threat, because if Ukraine is the heir to, to Kiev and Rus, then... I mean, okay, what sort of great power can't take Kharkiv, can't take a city that's, what, 40 kilometres? What sort of, you know, cultural messianic power can't take, can't convince Russian speakers, many of whom are ethnically Russian, whatever the hell that means, um, you know, in, in the context of Ukraine, that, um, that, they should, that they should join in some sort of cultural communion um, with, with Russia? What sort of... What sort of great power is that, that can't achieve these things? So there's that element, that kind of more day to day element. But also to go back to the, the history, I mean, this the idea is that there is this historical essence of Russia. And Putin all the time is talking about these 1000 years of history, you know, 1000 years of Russian history, the continuity of it. And that's why there's so much shade thrown at Lenin and the Bolsheviks um, and anyone who has ever weakened the state or allowed kind of external enemies to, to prosper over over the Russian state is because it's this idea that you have this 1000 years of continuous history and there's this historical essence and this, it was there in the Soviet Union and it was there under Peter the Great and anybody who strengthened this historical essence is is essentially a, a good guy and if you remember last year when the attacks on civilian infrastructure began in, in Ukraine in October of 2022 um, or, or, or that kind of that campaign of, of attacks um, Putin said, oh, we're fighting for our historical future. And I thought that was such a fascinating comment and actually really revealing because it's about 
in in a way he's he's he sort of is <laughs> um, first of all you think that sounds completely paradoxical but actually he, he, he sort of is in the sense of the way that history is being told in russia today it kind it won't function it won't function it, it wouldn't it would become just it would be too uh, it would be challenged too much by empirical reality if they weren't able to to, to win or and to ultimately control Ukraine. So it's a battle for for identity. There only there's only space for one conception of one of the current conceptions of Russian and of Ukrainian identity to exist. And I have to say, I hope you I hope Ukrainian identity wins. Yeah, I, I think one of the ironies about all of this is having talked to numerous Ukrainians about the war. Kievan Rus has not come up once. I don't think mm-hmm. Ukraine has oh, interest in history, sure, but has this kind of historical view or claim to a, being a great power. I think it's mostly focused on, hey, we just want to exist. This is, yes. uh, yeah. this is where we sad, are. To be honest. So let's pivot a little bit um, to something mm-hmm. you had talked about um, in the beginning of this episode and the book you read. Kind of Russian, if not support for war, um, Ascent to war. Um, mm-hmm. You said support wasn't the right word. Why do you say that? Yeah, so I understand Russian sort of what we call support for the war. I don't understand it as support so much as like an acquiescence. Um, so if you will allow me to kind of geek out just just slightly, oh, please do. Okay, good. <laughs> um, let's go. Um, no, the model I used um, is the spectrum of allies. So the original spectrum, like to understand this. So the original spectrum of allies comprises active support, passive support, neutral, passive opposition, and then active opposition. Um, and pressure groups and political parties use this and they work on the assumption, or, or some do, that, that movements won't win really by overpowering the active opposition. So if you're like a green organisation that wants to stop all kind of drilling for oil, you're not going to win Shell over, just leave Shell. You know, <laughs> There's no point wasting your time. How you win is by shifting support out from, from under your, your opponent. So the hypothesis is that don't focus focus on sort of active opponents and don't focus on active supporters as well because you've already won them. Um, you, to change views, you have to sort of acknowledge that most people are between somewhere, you know, between these two points and try to nudge them further along the spectrum of allies. So from passive opponent to neutral, from neutral to passive support, passive support to active support. Um, and that's a more productive of way of, of using your time. Now, the Kremlin spectrum of allies, as, as I kind of theorize it, it functions according to similar principles, but with some adaptation. So this spectrum comprises um, active support, passive ritual support, your loyal neutral, essentially my country, right or wrong, you know, since we've started the war, we might as well finish it, etc. Your apathy, your apathetic types, um, sort of, you know, what might maybe don't like the war, perhaps in a dem- dem- in a democratic country would even sort of protest or certainly would moan more actively about it, but feel like they can't do anything. And then your active opposition. So clearly, notably in, in this version, that the Kremlin doesn't just ignore <laughs> the active opposition, it's, it's set out to destroy it in a range of, of horrific ways um but then they try to nudge the apathetic more into a loyal neutrality that sense of my country right or wrong and you know sanctions help with this a bit you know that sense of well you know i i didn't really like the war though i couldn't do anything about it but now the west is you know doing xyz against us and all of this russophobia you know you know why should i want my country to be defeated etc etc um, and then you have your loyal neutrals. Hopefully they can be nudged into more ritual supporters. And what do I mean by ritual supporters? So this is important because a further twist in the Kremlin spectrum of allies is that it doesn't view active support as the ideal end result, but more as undesirable. So it distrusts any freely made political act, <laughs> even if it's in support of the regime. And we saw that with people who protested for the war, who were arrested as well. I mean, admittedly, um, none of them ended up in, in prison, but then of those of those who were detained at protests, very few statistically against the war, very few statistically have also ended up in prison. But. Would these be some of like the very nationalist telegram channels who would like complain about Russian generals? Hey, like they're not doing this war well enough. We support the war we want to win. So why are they screwing up? Um, yes, yes, you do have those people, definitely. And you certainly had them in 2014. And that was part of the issue in 2014 is things got a little bit out of hand because people wanted Donbass to be annexed and the Kremlin didn't want to do that because it was a useful, useful leverage. Um, so it's trying to avoid that situation. But in fact, some of the people who were arrested um, or detained um, for protesting, I mean, they were just ordinary people who were just 
just wanted to Bruce Swarbert that the peace police just arrested them. Um, I can I'll send you some links. It's really odd because they're like, yeah, bomb Ukraine. And he's like, come on. Um, but but yeah, um, so it's interesting. I think they try to shuffle instead the active supporters more into that ritual support category because then there's clear boundaries for what is and is not an acceptable way to show allegiance because you know if you really care and support something you don't just go along you know you start to get your own opinions of it and you and that's really quite dangerous so you know the putin regime has spent you know what two decades um, being very suspicious towards social mobilization that it of any kind that it doesn't control um, and that's why I think the only real risk to to this current situation in the short to medium term will be um, a further call for mobilization, because we saw that in September when there was that call for partial mobilization um, to, to bolster the Russian forces. Until that point, the Kremlin had you know, done everything to try to keep the structure of sociopolitical life in Russia, particularly in the European cities, I mean, geographically European cities, such that it actively and deliberately hindered political agency, but also so the war just was not noticeable. You know, speaking to my friends in Moscow, they just, it's like, what war? They just they just changed the branding on McDonald's a bit. Um, you know, obviously it's not called McDonald's anymore. It really wasn't a big impact. And I have to say that the same is broadly quite true now as well. Um, and I think that's why the decision to mobilise and in September, I think it was about resolving an intra-elite threat from those kind of the, the turbo or the ultra patriots that, that we briefly touched upon. But um, it clearly raised the potential for protest. We saw that um, and and it very quickly they tried to sort of row back on it, particularly in, 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 the, in the cities, because if you have this atmosphere where the war feels far away or almost unreal alongside this careful shuffling of, of different narratives, then you can reduce that that risk of, of political agent, agency, you know, which can be turned against you. Um, but so I, I think that would probably um, constitute the, the, the greatest risk to, to, to changing the, the attitudes that people have, have almost settled into now. So kind of trying to, to boil that down. So the Kremlin, mm-hmm. Putin and co are most interested in kind of friendly, apathetic people in, in, in a yeah. sense. Yeah, I mean, aren't you? <laughs> Everybody likes a friendly, apathetic person who's not going to bother them. <laughs> but no, on a more serious note, yes, they, they want people who um, who don't question, who don't question, who just, just go along. But the, the issue is, is that I think sometimes in the West there's this sense of, oh, wow, you know, Russians are all just like foaming at the mouth, um, you know, or the other side of the spectrum, Russians are just terrified waiting for this knock at the door. And it's much, much more complicated and nuanced than that. Um, and one of the important things that, that also has to be remembered is, and I, I know it sounds um, like you're just kind of making a point when you say it, but the war really, you know, it really did begin in 2014. Of course, this phase since 2022 has been far more intensive but the war, in terms of its ultimate aims um, of, of punishing and subjugating Ukraine to Russia and, you know, destroying its efforts to, you know, construct, to, you know, its own national sort of construction, that that was there in 2014 as well. And a lot of people were, were supportive of it then. And, and perhaps now people are not happy with the, the means um, but that's not always the same thing as as disliking the ends. So I guess a, a question that you kind of got at in that in that last point, we've talked about some of the the sources of support for the war um, among a small group, um, a group that I guess Putin and Co hope to, to shrink. Is there anything that you see that might cause Russians to to reevaluate their position to to no longer be in the mushy middle and perhaps turn against the war? So for me, it seems, again, to kind of go back to what I was talking about with mobilisation, I think if if there is more mobilisation, that's what's going to do it. Most people are not going to change their mind because of, of what's happening to Ukraine. Most people, the same is true in democracies. This is just about human beings. It's not about Russians. Um, most people don't really care about things un, un, until it affects them personally. Um, so once that begins to happen, once it begins to affect people personally who feel like they have a voice, i.e. in the European cities, because a lot it is affecting a lot of people, but in regions where people kind of just accept, uh, I suppose, accept their lot, as, as it were. So I think um, that, that that is where the biggest risk in the short to, to, to medium term will come from. 
um, you know, if you've demobilized political agency, it's quite a lot to to, to ask people um, to then rediscover it because when they do, then it, it also changes. I mean, attitudes really, if we think about this from a sociological point of view, attitudes rarely change without the range of actions available to people or the range of actions that people perceive as available to them also changing as well. And if you have mobilization, then certain things, and we saw this with the protests, which were very large, and fine, some of those people protesting maybe also protested in February or March against the war, but a lot of them also didn't. And that's because the range of actions available to them or that they perceived as as viable actions clearly shifted. Because if your choice is, okay, to go and protest and get beaten up, I can see why quite obviously one would not want to do that, especially if you felt it wouldn't change anything. But if your option is to either be sent off to a war that there's quite a high chance you're going to be maimed or even die in, um, or to go and get beaten up at a protest, even if you think that protest won't have much chance, but it could have some, you know, even just a small amount, well, then you're, you know, the, the situation's changed, right? The, the range of actions that are available to you have, have changed. So mobilisation, I think, is the biggest thing that will shift um, people's views on, on what, what are the acceptable range of actions available to them. Of course, there are others and different things will contribute to making protests or anger more volatile when it comes. Um, but I think that anything like the worsening economic situation, I don't think that will turn people against the war necessarily. But I think that if people turn against the war, it will then be quite an explosive element of, 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 that, of the disagreement with the war, if that makes sense. Jade, thank you for joining today. Thank you. Thanks again to Jade and to you, listener, for joining. Do you have thoughts? Share them with us and sign up for BMB Russia and Eurasia at the Twitter handle at Bear Market Brief. BMB Russia and Eurasia is a project of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, that is FPRI, a nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia. For more information on this initiative and on many others, be sure to visit fpri.org. We'll catch you next time.